Hello all, and uh, thank you very much for uh, attending this initial webinar in the MedMOTS Continuing Education Series on Topography and Special Contact Lenses. Um, I would like to thank our co-sponsors in this, um, NIDAC USA, number seven contact lenses from the UK, Belgian Optical Supply from Belgium, uh, iVinci uh, located in the Netherlands, and also ConLens uh, in Denmark. I would also like to thank, uh, on behalf of Medmont, uh, Randy Kajima for hosting and uh, presenting this, uh, this webinar. So over to you, Randy, and thank you very much for your time. Hey, thanks, Chris. And thanks, everybody, for logging in. So welcome to this session on the Medmont Topographer called Medmont Topographer Tips and Tricks. And the goal today is to really talk about some non-standard applications of the Medmont that maybe you haven't been introduced to. So we'll go through a whole series and we hope that there'll be at least a few that you'll be able to add and implement into your practice. My name is Randy Kojima. So let's begin by talking about the composite map capture. Many of you are familiar that the Metmont topographer as a small cone topographer gives us a fairly large area of capture. But in some eyes, especially when we have small fissures, we have long eyelashes, that we can lose some of the data from the periphery. And the composite capture was made to provide an understanding of as much of the cornea as possible. So this tool that Medmon has created allows us to image 100% of the cornea. And this has become incredibly valuable for the types of lenses that we use today. Corneal GPs are much larger today than they were 10 years ago. We're fitting so many more orthokeratology lenses and they're big corneal GPs. We fit scleral lenses and of course they go well beyond the cornea. So we need to have as much topography information as possible. Now that Medmont created a capture wizard for the composite capture, but I wanna tell you something kinda of crazy. I don't use the composite wizard. Now that I understand what Medmont wants as a way to link the various fixations together, I actually do something kind of different. So I wanna share with you what that is. So what I would do is if I'm trying to build a rigid lens, if I'm trying to build a specialty contact lens of some sort, and I want a lot of data on the eye, and I want accurate data on the eye, then I'm gonna take eight different captures on each eye. And so I'm not using the composite wizard, I'm manually capturing these eight different captures. And what they are is two captures on the visual axis, two on the geometric, and then the four different fixations that are required to give us that large view of the eye. So I'll try to explain what each one is. So first is your two captures on the visual axis. And of course, the visual axis is the patient's line of sight, and that gives us an understanding of what the patient is actually looking through in terms of corneal power. Where is their fixation point and, and the distribution within the pupil from that center point? The geometric capture is where we're going to center the placido reflection to the geometric axis of the eye, not the visual axis. And we'll explain why in a second. Now, how do you capture a visual axis capture? And that you've been doing since the beginning of time in corneal topography and with your MedMont. And that's simply having the patient fixate right down the axis of the instrument, and that gives us an understanding of the topography in relationship to the patient's line of sight. Whereas the geometric capture is used to center the placido reflection, so it's equally distributed on either side of the visible iris. So to capture a geometric axis capture, what you're going to do is have the patient fixate possibly one, maybe two, three, or four rings toward the nose. 
And the idea is you want to move the placido so it's off the nasal side, moving itself more on to the geometric axis. Then lastly, we're going to have our four fixations in the principal direction, superior, inferior, nasal, and temporal. Those, of course, like we would with the composite capture, will be converted into a topography and merged to create the larger view of the eye. So essentially what we have is our two visual axis captures, our two geometric and nasal, temporal, superior, and inferior fixation. We're going to highlight all of those maps and go up to analysis and composite eye. And what this does is it's going to merge all of those topographies together. We're going to have a much larger view of the cornea from our composite type fixations. But what it also does is it gives us more data by taking two images on the visual axis and two images on the geometric axis, we're adding more data points to the center capture giving us a better average of what may be the true eye shape. So it gives us a, a little more improved understanding of especially the central topography, but also by having a lot of data points spread toward the periphery of that um, cornea. So when we merge all of those maps together, now we have a really optimal topography to build a lens. So should you do this for every patient? And the story is no, you don't want to do this capture on everyone. You don't want to do it on a screening topography. If you're just trying to understand the general eye shape, is this a normal cornea? Is it a stigmatic eye? Is it a diseased eye? You don't have to do a composite capture. If you're trying to build an ortho K lens, a scleral lens, a corneal GP for presbyopia, if you're doing any kind of specialty contact lens, then you want as many data points as possible. So doing this type of capture really makes sense. And orthokeratology is such a good example where we require a lens that's has to be micron accurate. It has to be hyper accurate. So we want this topography to be, that we build our lens off of to be as accurate as it possibly can. Now let's just review this visual axis versus geometric because this always brings great confusion among um, many in the industry. What is the benefit of doing a visual axis versus a geometric? What, why would I do both? Now, as you can tell, this is a right topography. The Medmont shows you much more data on the nasal side because of our patient's fixation. The temporally displaced fovea results in our patients fixating slightly temporal um, as they look down the axis of the instrument. So that causes the topography to be skewed or favoring the nasal side. So you can always tell which is the nasal side on your topographies because the patient will show more blue on the nasal side and will be missing a lot of the temporal cornea. So this is a visual axis capture and this is incredibly important because it tells us what powers are the patient looking through um, from the visual axis throughout the pupil? Is it centered? Is it asymmetric? Is there anything unusual? Now, when you look at the placido itself, it becomes very obvious to see how a visual axis capture favors the nasal side. Notice how the rings have actually spilled onto the sclera out here, whereas on the temporal side, the placido is missing some of the peripheral cornea. And that's all to do with that angle alpha or angle kappa that you learned in first year optics. Now, if we consider that our topographies are really skewed to the nasal side, 
then we really aren't understanding if the eye has any natural displacement. Is the eye naturally displaced nasally? Is the eye naturally displaced temporally? Or is it a very symmetric eye? You, you really don't know unless you have a geometric capture. So that's why we do a geometric capture and try to center the placido so that it's equal distance all the way around from the borders of the visible iris. And that is done by asking the patient to look one, two, three, maybe four rings toward the nose. So you will ask the patient to fixate one ring toward the nose, then assess whether the placido looks centered. If it doesn't, then go two rings. If it's still looking like it's on the nasal side, then go three or four rings. So move as many rings as you need to. The uh, angle alpha can be as, as low as something like three degrees to as high as I believe 12 degrees if I remember correctly. So there's a wide range of angles that can exist in the population, meaning that it may be half a ring, it may be four rings, it may be more. Now, once that you have your visual axis captured, you know what the patient is actually looking through when they fixate. However, when you have the geometric capture, you understand if the eye has any natural displacement. As an example, you'd look at the visual axis capture and say the cap of the cornea, the yellow green border, looks like it's pulled to the temporal side. Whereas when you look at the geometric capture, it actually looks like the contours might be stretched a little more nasal than they are temporal. So at the very least, we would expect our lens to position very well laterally, maybe if anything, a little bit nasal. So that's the benefit of doing a geometric capture is you have an understanding of natural eye displacement. Now, when we want to build an orthokeratology lens, we uh, talked earlier that an ortho-K lens needs to be built to microns of accuracy. We attempt to construct our ortho-K lenses to be seven microns away from the eye, maybe five microns away from the eye, maybe 10 microns away from the eye, but within microns is what we're shooting for. So we want as little error as possible. One of the things that a topographer cannot predict is where exactly will a lens equilibrate? Where will it settle? Where will it want to naturally position in between blinks? And what Medmon has done is this ingenious analysis called the ideal eye. And what it does is it takes your topography and converts it into a symmetric surface. So symmetric across the flat, symmetric across the steep. And what that essentially does is it gives you a prediction of how the lens would settle and therefore the it gives you an accurate interpretation of what the fluorescein pattern might look like. So to do that, what you're going to do is take the topography that you have. If you're using this customized composite capture like I do, then you're going to click on your composite icon that you created. If you have only one single quality capture, then you can do it with that one image. So you take your topography, then go up to analysis and ideal eye, and what it will automatically do is create an additional topography. And if this is a left eye, it's going to create a new left eye with a different icon that's your ideal eye. Then what you can do is use the contact lens software to build your lens from that ideal eye capture. And this will give you a very accurate interpretation of your fluorescein. So that's the, the value of, of going through this method. You don't need to create an ideal eye for a conventional GP lens. It's just not that close to the cornea. It's normally about 20 microns, maybe 30 microns away from the eye. We don't have to predict its centration as accurately as we do with an ortho K lens that may only be five microns away. So use this ideal eye uh, function. It can be really valuable when you're using the contact lens software 
in orthokeratology lens construction. Now, speaking of building a lens from the contact lens software, of course, that requires a good quality capture. And if you look at this topography, would you say that I've done a good job of taking this patient's capture? What we might look at is how the cornea has this very steep curvature across the center, normal for any cornea where the cap or apex of the eye is steepest. But you'll notice as we move toward the temporal side, the eye has this very smooth and gradual rate of flattening that you see here. Whereas as we go to the opposing side, it appears that the cornea has this sudden drop or what you might call a divot where the cornea has this curvature that has this sudden cliff that it drops off and we have this flat spot. Now, is this naturally occurring? Is this trauma? Is this uh, topography error? And it is definitely possible, as we all know, for the rings to become distorted from poor tear film. It's possible that we have disrupted epithelium that may create a false, uh, false area of data. Well, let's look at the placido. That's always a good start. You notice the central rings look really good, parallel and even, clearly defined, as we move across the surface, we have lots of area of quality reflection. But here in this area, we see the rings distorting, they're graying out, they're um, collapsing on each other, and we know that can create topographical error. Our slit lamp indicated that this patient had healthy epithelium, and there's no history of any disease or trauma or infection in this eye. So why do we have this odd area? It must be poor tear film. So if we were to take this topography and attempt to build a contact lens from it using the contact lens software, you notice something is amiss. We have a with the rule cornea where the lens should land at three and nine o'clock, but because of this false hot spot, this false high spot, the lens appears to ha want to have a bearing point on that high point and then finds an opposing point down here. Remember, again, this is a with the rule cornea. The flat meridian is very close to 0 and 180, so the landing of a rigid corneal GP should be along the flattest meridian, 0, 180, not at around 1030 and 430. So I think what we're looking at is some topographical error created by the fact that I did a poor job of this capture, that I wasn't paying attention to the ring reflection in this area, and that's giving us poor data. So can we fix this? The patient just left and drove two hours back home, and they're waiting for us to design their custom lens. That's going to take days for it to arrive from the lab and we might find out the lens isn't going to work. So this isn't an optimal scenario. Can we edit this information to ensure that we create the right first lens? Well, you can. And what you do is you take that topography, you go to Analysis and Edit, and what that will do is it'll allow you to visualize each of the data points that the Medmont topographer is able to pick up. So you'll notice the dozens of points in the center, the hundreds of points in the pupillary area, the thousands of points as we go out toward the periphery. And you will pick up on how irregular this area has become. And so we want to edit that out. So what we'll do is we'll take our cursor, move it across all of these points that seem to be creating false data. And basically you're just turning the, that analysis off. You're nullifying those points of analysis. Then you go back to analysis and remove points, and that allows you to analyze the topography without this garbage, without this error that I've created because I didn't ensure the patient was blinking properly. I didn't ensure that we had quality tear film. 
So then we have an analysis without that poor data and we can build our contact lens using the contact lens software. And notice that once you've used the topography without that, that false high spot, we get the appearance of a rigid contact lens that we expect on the flat meridian of the eye, the blue line that you see here, that's your flat axis measured by the topographer. And along that same line, you see the contact lens touching down the way you expect it to. If we compare that to our lens built off the erroneous topography, you'll notice that high point is really messing up how the rigid lens would land. So I'm sure you can imagine how valuable this tool can be when we're using the contact lens software. Now, one of the considerations that you need to be aware of is the editing option can only be used with a single topography. It can't be used with the composite capture. So if you're dealing with a single topography that has air, edit that uh, first before making your composite. Now the contact lens software is this incredible tool that uh, we've been discussing. And uh, this session won't go into great detail on using the contact lens software, but I wanted to encourage you to use some of the things we've discussed use that customized composite capture to create that large view of the eye and then take that to the contact lens software. If you're building an ortho K lens, take that optimized composite capture, convert it to the ideal eye, then build your ortho keratology lens. This contact lens software is a tool that we use at the university to build 100% of our rigid contact lenses. Um, why would we build a lens from K readings, which is this three millimeter ring at the center, when we can use thousands of data points of elevation to understand how do I optimally land my contact lens? How do I create the ideal apical clearance? How do we create the appropriate tericity in flat and steep meridian? How do we create the, the ideal edge lift all the way around? You know, the contact lens software becomes this very valuable tool to make all that possible, to improve your first fit success and um, provide the um, patient the best possible outcome. Now, one of the tools that I know practitioners do not use very often, and I have to admit, I don't use it a great deal, but it does have value for specific patients. And, and that's the planar versus perspective option. And we generally would have our topographies as a planar, as a, a two-dimensional image. But the perspective view gives us an enhanced understanding, more like a 3D perspective. And when you click on display and then perspective, you get this view that looks something like this. In this case, I have an axial interpretation of this topography that's now being converted to a 3D-like image. Although I'm not really seeing this eye in 3D, I'm not seeing how the cone is much more curved than the superior cornea, which is flatter. And that's because your perspective scaling value is at zero. So let's alter this value to try to give us more perspective on this eye shape. So if I increase that to 30, now we're beginning to see how curved that keratoconic eye is inferior and how um, uncurved it is, how flat it is, superior of the apex. So this can be a valuable tool when you're trying to explain the eye shape to a patient. I don't think this has value clinically from the perspective of, is this a diseased eye? Is this an eye that requires a corneal GP or a scleral? I don't think for any of these conversations it's worthwhile, but for patient discussions, I think this has great value. If you right click on top of this topography and select your pan tool, then you can move the 
image to show a uh, cross section if you wanted to see the perspective from the nasal side or looking from the top down on the cone you can adjust that angle that you're looking at the topography so again for a patient who has keratoconus that has a hard time understanding what you're talking about you have corneal thinning um, so what? What does that actually mean to me? Why is it that my vision is so poor relative to a healthy normal cornea? And, and of course seeing the eye in this perspective scaling gives us a much better understanding, gives the patient a much better understanding of what their eye shape may be contributing um, adversely to their quality of vision. Now let's look at this topography and let's ask ourselves a very simple question. Is this a patient that requires a toric GP lens? Let's say a toric multifocal RGP or a toric ortho K. And if we think about corneal astigmatism at 1.25 diopters of corneal sill, we don't have a very high astigmatism. For those of you who think in terms of the Ks in millimeters, that's approximately 0.25 millimeters of corneal astigmatism. So let's agree that this is a very moderate or low corneal astigma. Now, what would the textbook say as a starting point for a rigid contact lens requiring a back toric or bi toric lens. And that's generally in the neighborhood of two diopters to two and a half diopters. So clearly this patient shouldn't require a toric lens. Well, let's think about the eye a different way. Remember that key readings are measuring three millimeters of the center. They're not measuring where a 9.5 millimeter lens would land down where a 10 or 11 millimeter lens might land itself down. We want to understand the eye shape toward the periphery. That gives us much better perspective on what we need to, uh, what irregularity or tericity that we need to align to. So let's ask ourselves, is the peripheral cornea symmetric or is the peripheral cornea toric and we can do an analysis that will give us that answer. We simply go to analysis and details then that brings up your analysis details window that you see here. Let's first set the cord of measure at eight millimeters. So we are measuring a diameter across the eye of approximately eight millimeters. Now, why, why that? And it, it really, you can set it at any diameter that you want, but a 9.5 diameter corneal GP generally has approximately an eight millimeter optic zone. So that's its point of greatest bearing. That might be a likely starting point to measure your, your sagittal depth. If you're dealing with an orthokeratology lens, it has a six millimeter optic zone, typically. It has a one millimeter width of reverse curve, typically, that runs 360 degrees around. So that is an eight millimeter um, diameter of where the alignment zone begins. So again, eight millimeters might make sense as the cord or diameter of measure. So now that we've set our cord of measure, we want to click on the flat meridian to understand the depth of the lower height of the eye. And that's your weighted average height, your sagittal depth. It's 1,085 microns. Then we're gonna click on the steep axis and determine what we have for a steep meridian sagittal depth. So essentially what we're looking for is what is the sagittal depth across the flat? Not what is the radius across the flat, what is the height of the eye across the flat? What is the height of the eye across the steep meridian? And the difference between those tells you essentially the peripheral corneal tericity of the eye. But instead of measuring it as radius, we're measuring it as microns, as height difference. 
So in your analysis um, window, in your attribute window, you can add this attribute that makes it easy for you to understand that analysis without having to go to the analysis details, set the core diameter, click on the flat, measure the sag, click, click on the steep, measure the sag. This little attribute that Medmont created gives us these values. So I have this on my main window and whenever I'm thinking about a corneal uh, GP lens, be it a multifocal lens, a single vision, a ortho K, I have an understanding of how toric the eye is. Now, what is the threshold of requiring a toric? At around 30 microns, when you have 30 or greater of sagittal differential, that's where the lens will begin to rock back and forth if you're using a symmetric landing lens. In other words, the eye is so much deeper across the steep meridian that our contact lens can't align well enough that it's just going to be moved around by the lid, it's going to be pushed against the superior cornea, lifting against the inferior. With each blink, there's going to be this unstable rocking back and forth between superior and inferior. Therefore, a toric landing with much more depth across the vertical is going to help us to stabilize that contact lens. So this attribute window is a important tool to provide you with the specific analysis that you use all the time. This is the way I've set up the window. Medmont will send this out to you with these attributes at the top. These are your default attributes. You may add a few others like I've done and that will give you expanded analysis for the areas that you're interested in. So how do you expand that window to include more um, metrics? And basically you just go to the top of that attribute window and you click on the up and down arrows that you see here, your arrange icon. And what that'll do is it'll bring up this window. And you'll notice if you scroll this down, it'll show you all of the dozens and dozens of attributes that have been created um, for the various applications that some may be more focused on. Then you click on that attribute, use this little arrow and it'll move it across to your active window. And that way, it'll always be apparent on your main attribute window. If there's stuff on there that you don't use all the time, then simply click on it on your selected window, use the left arrow, move it back across, and you won't have it there cluttering up that analysis for you. If you're relatively good mathematically, if you're a bit of a programmer, you can actually create your own attributes using the add edit icon that looks like this at the top of your attribute window. So this can be a helpful tool if there's very specific things that you do in your practice that you need information on. Is there a way that you build your contact lenses that is really specific in terms of the data that it's looking for. That can be created. Your distributor may also be able to help with this if there's a, a path that you want to follow and you're having a hard time getting there. So I want to sh wanted to share with you what I use on the attribute window and, and maybe this has some value in your practice. So I, I'm going to throw at you some ideas of what I put up and why I think it's valuable to, to us or at least to me in, in the per type of work that I do. Of course, we all favor K readings. That is something that gives us immediately an understanding of corneal astigmatism, how it may relate to our refractive sill, the orientation with the rule against the rule, oblique, and so on. So of course, this is an important value that we need to understand. The eccentricity has value because it tells you about how the eye changes from center to periphery. So from the center, what is the rate of corneal flattening of the eye? The higher the rate of flattening, the higher the eccentricity. So in this case, this patient has a 0.74 eccentricity 
I know that if I'm practicing ortho K, the higher the eccentricity, the better the potential for an, a myopic shift for an ortho keratology change. So that makes this a good candidate. The second thing I understand is when there's a huge difference between the eccentricity of the flat meridian and the eccentricity of the steep meridian, that's indicating this eye has a very toric periphery. I may require a toric lens for this eye. We can look at the disease detection indices, the IS, SAI, SRI value, and they tell us whether the eye is normal, is suspect, or abnormal. And if all the indices are lighting up in green, it's an absolutely normal eye. If they're lighting up in yellow, that's suspect. If they're all red, then that would be considered over the threshold of irregularity. Now, this patient has some indices in yellow, um, but I really, this may be that it's a limbus to limbus astigmatism. It's a high angle alpha with a lot more blue on the nasal side, less on the temporal side. If we were to geometrically center this topography, I wonder if the second value might go down. So again, is this a diseased eye? No, not, the three indices are not lighting up in red. Now, the a sagittal differential is that valuable tool that we use to understand when we should go with a toric GP, when we should go with a symmetric. Again, the threshold is 30 microns. Our pupil width is 3.3 millimeters. So if we're using a multifocal, uh, or a multifocal contact lens whose add power kicks in at four millimeters, then we know our pupil size is too small for that particular design. We're not going to push the plus into the pupil. So pupil size is incredibly valuable. VID, of course, is a valuable understanding related to any custom contact lens and related to any contact lens in general. Should we be fitting a 10 millimeter cornea with a 14.5 soft lens as an example? Now these EH cord attributes are valuable for you if you're a scleral lens practitioner. For me, my, the scleral lens I use is a 16.3 diameter that lands at 14.8 millimeters diameter. Its sagittal depth is calculated and labeled according to its diameter of 14.8, its uh, measurement of 14.8. So I want to punch in to the Medmont software here if the diameter that my scleral lens is measured over, and again, that's 14.8 millimeters. That gives me a estimate, a, sorry, an estimated height of the sagittal depth across the 0180 meridian, the 3210, and the 15330 axis. It gives me an understanding of the sagittal depth. So I can take this estimated height, let's call it approximately 35 or 3600 microns. I add the fluid layer that I desire between lens and cornea, let's say 300 or 400 microns. That tells me I should start with approximately a 4000 micron scleral lens. The Wavefront aberrations are valuable related to orthokeratology. We know that when we want to create good myopia control, we want to increase the aberrations. When we compare the spherical aberration before and after ortho-K, we want to see this number going up. It appears that coma also goes up when we do orthokeratology. Although it's not desired visually, it actually does create better myopia control. At least the studies show the higher the aberrations, the better the myopia controlling effect. Now finally, these are some of the attributes that we've created specific to a lens design that we use. So this is one where we've we've created our own attribute to give us the data that we want to use the most and that would help us to be more efficient. So again, your lab can tell you the information you want to pull out of your Medmont topographer. Your distributor may be able to assist with being able to construct these attributes or finding those attributes that may already exist.
Now you'll notice that the MedMont will automatically measure the pupil when it's apparent. And it, at times, it can be difficult when you have a very dark iris patient for the software to find that border between the 100% pixels of the pupil and the almost 100% pixels of the iris if it's especially dark. When you can make out the pupil, you get a measurement of that diameter, an estimate of that diameter and this is an important understanding because related to any irregular cornea it really gives us an appreciation of how the powers are distributed within the pupil across this meridian of the eye you notice this keratoconic patient has relatively normal shape so we would expect, at least across this meridian, the, the aberrations to be relatively low. However, when we take the axis line across this meridian, across the cone, you notice a massive differential. We go from 53 diopters in the pupil to approximately 34 diopters within the pupil. So that's around a 19 diopter distribution of power within the pupillary borders. So of course, this is suggestion that this patient may require rigid lens optics to achieve any kind of uh, appreciable quality acuity. You can also define the visible iris and you can do that numerous ways. You can go to annotate and grab a ruler and just click and drag your cursor across, or you can use this iris definition tool. And what that does is creates a circle that you just pull out to the border of your visible iris, and then it will define your VID on your attribute window. This has a added benefit in the contact lens software, and I'll, I'll show you that here, where we have a patient with a 13 millimeter visible iris. We have a huge cornea. We want to fit this patient with a scleral lens because of this irregularity that the patient had. I think if I remember correctly, it was a, uh, a herpes simplex a virus case where it created a lot of irregularity in the, uh, in the cornea. The aberrations were rather high. So we used the contact lens software and let's presume I was attempting to fit an incredibly small scleral lens like 14.5 in diameter. You'll notice when we define the iris using the annotate screen, it gives you this blue border of where the iris is. So let's just highlight that a second. We have our 13 millimeter visible iris. We've placed our scleral lens on top of that topography. We show the apical clearance that we have. We show the increased fluid just in the mid periphery. Then as we move toward the visible iris and the limbus, you'll notice that lens is coming crashing in to where the limbal stem cells are likely to be or where the limbus is likely to be. So if we were to go one step further and use the MedMont contact lens software and settle that contact lens in, as you know, the average settling of a vaulting scleral lens is in the neighborhood of 125 to 150 microns. So we need to show how that lens will sink and settle into the soft, spongy, conjunctival tissue. If I've settled that lens in 125 microns, now I can see how that lens has created all kinds of compression at the visible iris where our limbus is believed to be. So this is a very concerning fit. There's no way we should be fitting a 14 5 millimeter scleral lens on this huge eye. We definitely want a much bigger contact lens. Let's switch gears and talk about orthokeratology. Of course, topography is used so routinely in corneal topography analysis, both pre-fitting and post-fitting. The way the instrument is set up, you have a scale in your subtractive map of approximately plus 10 to minus 10. Now, I should probably back up a little bit and explain that the subtractive map is the 
orthokeratologist's best friend. What it does is it compares before ortho-K to after ortho-K and gives you the subtracted difference. It subtracts all of th the thousands of points of data here from the thousands of points of data post-treatment and tells you how you have changed the eye where the eye is colder in color, you have flattened the cornea out. The eye is less myopic. Where you've steepened the cornea up, the cornea is more hyperopic. You've um, increased the curvature of the eye over time between these two visits. Now, the way the scale is set up, you have the plus 10 to minus 10, and we're really not seeing a lot of action in this orthokeratology treatment. It looks like we have a blue treatment zone centered to the pupil, but I'm not seeing a great deal of definition. If you look on the graph, we have this incredibly wide range on our graph, yet we're really only using a narrow area of that data to um, understand what's happened. So let's alter the scale. Let's click on the standard power difference and let's create multiple different scales. If you're an orthokeratologist, you will be fitting patients of all power, um, all different kinds of powers. They may be down to minus one diopter. They may be up to 10 diopters. So you want a wide range of scale options. Let's change the scale now to plus six to minus six. Now you're noticing a little more blue being picked up. Um, and now we're seeing a little more obviously that our blue area flattening is well centered to the pupil. Let's go another step. Let's change this to a three diopter scale. And now we're seeing a more obvious blue treatment zone. We're distributing the power range across the graph in a way that gives us much more detail. Let's go all the way to a two diopter scale. And now we're actually off the scale. Because this patient has approximately two and a half diopters of power change in the center, but we've altered the scale to be tighter than the amount of change on I, the effect is off of our scale. So we've gone a little bit too far. For this patient, a three diopter scale really gives you an understanding of the peaks of that myopic shift that we have this high point of effect, this high point of effect. We can say that the blue treatment zone is well centered to the pupil. When we click our cursor on the visual axis on the patient's fixation point, we compare the radius of the eye before ortho K to the radius of the eye after ortho K. We have a two and a half diopter refractive change. So we don't have to do a refraction because the topography tells us exactly how much power has been altered to the fovea. So this subtractive map, for those of you who do orthokeratology, is a very critical piece of analysis that you want to do with all of your effects. And for more information on orthokeratology analysis with your Medmont, talk to your Medmont distributor, go to the Medmont website. There are numerous videos related to pre-ortho-K analysis as well as post-ortho-K analysis. So you see the value of having multiple scales. If you have a patient with a 10 diopter effect, then you're gonna want a 10 diopter scale. If you have a patient with a six diopter effect, you're going, going to want to alter and tighten up that scale to be closer to the effect that you're creating. If you have a lower myopic shift, you're going to want to reduce that scale. And it's, it's simply a click of the button to alter it from one to the next. Medmont makes it very easy to go from one to the other. Now, while we're talking about orthokeratology, is this a good orthokeratology outcome? Would you be happy with this effect? Is it the optimal bullseye that we are, are encouraged to create when we do orthokeratology? And of course, we can see a blue area of flattening well centered to the pupil. Uh, our treatment zone appears maybe a little bit small relative to the pupil, but we're very happy that it's well centered. We click our cursor on the center, 
compare the power of the cornea before ortho K to after ortho K. With our cursor clicked on the visual axis, we can see this patient has a 3.64 diopter RX change. So this is an awesome ortho keratology outcome. This is exactly what we want. Now, a second question related to this same case. Is this an optimal myopia controlling outcome? If this is a young child and you were tasked with trying to slow down the eye growth, have you created the ideal outcome for this patient to slow down, to create that signal to stop the eye growth or at least to slow it down? Well, what do we look at? How do we know that this is a good outcome? It's good bullseye. It would be good for a, um, a general analysis of ortho K, but is it a good myopia controlling outcome? So let's focus in on this pupil again. We've talked about the analysis within the pupil and how it shows up on the graph down below here. So let's focus in on this area. And what you see is the most minus effect on the fovea. But you'll notice that that hyper, sorry, that shift that the orthokeratology lens creates is causing a drop in effect as you go away from center. And this is actually desirable in myopia control. You notice from our most minus to our most plus or least minus, there's a 3.62 diopter shift in the power of the eye. That can kind of be seen on the analysis here. You have most blue in the center, then you have green here at the pupil border, which is essentially zero. So this patient has been given by you a 3.62 diopter add. <clears throat> and if we talk to the experts, the people like Earl Smith at the University of Houston that tells us for good myopia control, we want to attempt to push the maximum plus within the pupil that's possible. That will be the best way to slow down eye growth. So whether you're doing it with orthokeratology or soft multifocal lenses, ensuring that you're pushing the plus into the pupil is the goal. Now, Medmont gives us another way to look at this. We can use the numeric meridian map on your display window. So if you go to the display pull down and then click that box or check the box that has numeric meridian next to it, then it'll create this image. And I only use this when I'm doing a myopia control analysis. I generally don't like the clutter of all these numbers on the window, but some practitioners like to have the data on the radius of the eye from center to periphery. And certainly for myopia control analysis, this has value. The way you look at it is in the center, you notice we have a 3.8 diopter flattening in the center. But as we go to the periphery, it's about 0.1 diopter in the plus. So this patient has a 3.9 diopter, <clears throat> excuse me, RX change toward this meridian. If we head toward this meridian, we're at approximately 0.8 diopters of power. So there's a three diopter power shift from center to periphery. So of course this analysis will depend in which direction you go. The goal of course being that pushing the maximum amount plus in the pupil appears to be the way to do good myopia control. Now that's a little more obvious if I zoom in and you can do that by right clicking with your cursor on the topography map and then just zooming in a little bit. Now one of the things that I kind of favor is using the spherical aberration values that the Medmont gives us. And the reason for this is it gives us more of a global picture. If we look at the plus power created along one single meridian, that's really not the understanding 360 degrees around. How much plus are we pushing throughout the pupil? So using the spherical aberration values that the Medmont gives is a more big picture analysis. And what it can do is tell us, we started with this 
aberration or this spherical aberration as a starting point, you did orthokeratology on the patient. How did it shift that spherical aberration? And you want a positive shift in, in spherical aberration. You want it to move toward positive spherical aberration and that is that will create good myopia control. The more spherical aberration the studies suggest, the better the myopia control. Now, one of the most valuable tools, and probably everybody has been communicated this by your distributor, but one of the best ways that we can communicate with our lab, we have this awesome tool in the MedMont that gives us thousands of data points that the lab can use to import into their software to build an ideal lens to send that data to their lathes to construct for us a optimal rigid lens. Being able to communicate that topography is a, one of the things that I think uh, is the most important tool that the MedMon gives us. In many cases, we may not understand our manufacturer's lens the way we need to. They're the experts on the lens and being able to communicate the information to them um, helps them to do a better job. So what you wanna do is highlight the topographies you wanna send to the lab. And then once you've highlighted all the maps that you want, go up to File and Export, and that will create a little export file that you can then email to the, to the lab. In this case, you'll notice that the four maps that I selected, one, two, three, four maps, have created a file that's approximately 3.1 megabytes of data. So easily emailed to our distributor or our lab for them to construct and send us the optimal lens that we require. So really valuable um, ability to communicate digitally with your lab, the topographies. Almost every lab that I'm aware of has the MedMont software. Even if they don't have the MedMont topographer, they can download the MedMont software and be able to see what you see, to be able to analyze how you analyze. It's like they have um, a full version of the MedMont software and they're able to take your topography and manipulate it. MedMont's put a number of videos on the website, on their website related to various topics that we've discussed today, um, expanding on a lot of the topics we've discussed today like ortho uh, contact lens use, disease detection, capture, all of these topics. So use this as a reference, uh, a, po a point of reference if you want additional training. And of course, your MedMont distributor is an expert at the instrument. So don't be afraid to ask them if you have any questions whatsoever. Now, I would encourage you to spend it, 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 the additional time that we have um, recording any questions you have. The window will be open for a few more minutes. So if I've left any gray areas, if there's anything that isn't completely clear, please don't be afraid to write that question in and we'll address that in the May 28th panel session where there'll be a number of experts and we can ask them for their expertise related to all of the questions that have been compiled. So everyone, thank you very much for your attendance in, in this event and we hope that this lecture has great value to you. Again, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Randy, for, uh, for the great presentation. Sincerely appreciate that. I didn't introduce myself at first. My name is uh, Christopher Ferguson. I am the new business development director for uh, North America, South America, and Europe. So again, I sincerely thank you for your time. Thank you again to Randy. And by all means, please keep the uh, questions coming in. And uh, we also have some other uh, webinars that we're working on as well, too. Uh, there's one on May 14th, and this one will be entitled What Eye Shape Tells Us About Contact Lens Fit. We'll also be uh, having another one on May 20th. This is uh, Case Studies and Advanced Topography for Fitting Specialty Contact Lenses. And then, of course, the May 28th uh, webinar is uh, a panel of experts going to be answering your questions regarding the um regarding some of the, the answers and questions that you we weren't able to uh, to get to so again thank you so much for your time and again randy thanks again